Good evening. I would like to call this meeting of the Tyler Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. There is the presence of a quorum here tonight, and the meeting has been duly called in the time and manner required. Uh, we have several items to cover tonight, and we will get right to it. The first action items we have uh, are the canvassing and declaring the results for the May 7, 2016 general trustee election. Crawford, do you have a, do we have an action item or do we just move to canvas the votes? I do not have an action item for you, but we move to canvas the votes. Okay. All right. So, uh, Reverend Mason, you want to make that motion? I will. According to the results received from the general election, I move that uh, we elect R. Wade Washman, District 1, Gene Washington, District 3, where's uh, Fritz? Fritz Hager, District 6. six. six. <laughs> All right. So board. Motion to canvas Members. those votes. A second. Thank you. Any discussion? I'll just say we're glad to have all of you guys back. Uh, having a solid team together makes makes things run much smoother. I've seen them all different ways. So congratulations on you guys coming back. All right, uh, motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, that motion carries 7-0. We now have oath of office for school trustees. If uh, you want all three of them down there. Um, just, they're gonna sign a document. Um, having been presented with the certificate of election, I ask that you execute the statement of officer that you have before you. Having executed that statement, if you will come down front and raise your right hand. raise your right hand and repeat after me I state your name do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the duties of the office of trustee of the Tyler Independent School District of the state of Texas and will to the best of my ability Preserve, protect, and defend, Preserve, protect, and defend. The, constitution and laws the Constitution and laws of the United States and of this state. So help me God. Okay, and when you return to your seats, the oath is at your place. If you'll execute that, please. And again, congratulations, and thank you for your commitment and service to the district. All right. Next item we have is the uh, reorganization of the Board of Trustees. This is always somewhat of an awkward uh, topic, sitting in a public meeting reorganizing, but this is the way the state has us do it. So um, that's the way we do it. It's out in the open and it's public. And so uh, at this time, uh, first we'll take a motion for uh, president of the board for the upcoming year. I'll move that uh, we just keep things the same, the president, and nominate you, Andy, as to remain president of the board. Okay. Second that motion. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that motion carries. Next, meet, we move to uh, vice president. Anyone has a motion for vice president? I'll entertain it at this time. I'll make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I move we continue with 
um, Dr. Nation as Vice President of the Board. One okay. more year. Okay. Is there a second to that? I second the motion. All right. Ms. Washington, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. All right. And we need a board secretary, I believe, too. So I believe Ms. Orr has been that person for quite a few years. Uh, so I'll take a motion there. I move that we elect Gina Orr as the board secretary for the incoming year. Thank you, Reverend Mason. Second? I'll second. All right. Dr. Nation, all in favor say aye. 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 Assuming she'll accept. <laughs> all right. Any no's? All right. Secretary. Next, we move to um, Roman numeral four. And the first item there is a presentation um, by our legal counsel, Mr. Marcos Ronquillo. If you step up to the podium, appreciate you coming down again tonight. Thank you, sir. You. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board, um, and uh, Mr. Superintendent, uh, what we have uh, tonight is basically a uh, presentation regarding um, our review, our analysis, and investigation of the uh, current desegregation case involving the Tyler Independent School District. Um, what I want to do is, is basically give the board um, a, an overview of our analysis and, more importantly, where we come down on that analysis. To obtain, uh, print the, to obtain the unitary status for the school district, uh, we must basically prove uh, two elements. The first, we must show that the school district has complied in good faith with its desegregation orders for a reasonable period of time, and that it has eliminated the vestiges of prior discrimination to the extent practicable. A declaration of unitary status signals the beginning of the end of federal judicial supervision over this school district's operations. Furthermore, uh, school boards that operate or have operated state-compelled dual school systems have the affirmative duty to convert to a unitary system in which racial discrimination is eliminated root and branch. And unitary status is achieved when a school district is devoid of racial discrimination with regard to faculty, staff, student assignment, facilities, transportation, and extracurricular activities. Compliance with the court orders for a reasonable period of time is paramount. Um, in this particular instance, uh, the court entered an original desegregation order on July the 27th, 1970, and there were 15 modified orders during that time. Now, it's, it's important to point out the court order relates to African American and white students and African American and white teachers only. It does not relate to, does not involve, does not impact. Uh, Latino or Hispanic students or Latino or Hispanic teachers. The school district uh, has operated under this desegregation order for over 45 years. More importantly, the school district has complied with each of those orders. Since 2001 to 2013, the court has approved the actions requested by Tyler as being in the best interest of students. The Department of Justice came in, did a thorough review in 2012 and found that the school district complied in the areas of facilities and extracurricular activities. And we understand that they're also very, very close with respect to transportation. Since 1972, Tyler has had no history of judicial enforcement or DOJ enforcement actions. By DOJ, I mean the Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Division in Washington, DC. And since 1972, uh, DOJ has not had any enforcement actions of the desegregation orders. I want to talk a little about the green factors. The green factors is basically a reference back to the green case. And early on in our desegregation history, uh, the Supreme Court identified certain facets, certain elements of a desegregation case. And more importantly, what are those elements that a school district must show, uh, must demonstrate they have, they have, that they have achieved unitary status? The first is faculty. The second is staff. The third is student assignments facilities, transportation, and extracurricular activities. With respect to faculty and staff assignments, the
The racial composition of faculty and staff within a school district schools must be substantially the same as the racial composition of faculty and staff throughout the district. And the racial composition of the principals, teachers, teacher aides, and other staff who work directly with children at a school cannot be such that it indicates that that particular school is intended for African-American students or white students. And let me make a, a very quick point here. Uh, we're talking about a percentage year in and year out. We take the percentage of African-American students with white students and you take the percentage of African-American teachers with white teachers. And the case law is very clear that at each and every campus you should not have a situation where that campus is identified as being a racially identifiable campus. And so we look for the variations, uh, we call them singleton, 15, uh, 15 plus or minus or 20 plus or minus deviation on those campuses. Also, I might want to add, too, with respect to faculty and staff assignments, we're not talking about any requirements under the court order to hire or to add any particular teacher group by race or ethnicity. We're talking about the assignments of staff and faculty. Nevertheless, um, like other school districts that we have represented in the past in desegregation cases, uh, we do like to uh, acknowledge uh, the growth in number of African American teachers um, here at Tyler Independent School District from 1969 to 2015. And I, and I do need to also point out, when compared to your peers, when compared to school districts of similar size, when compared to the state average, when compared to the national average, of African American teachers in the pipeline that are ready to go and get into the classroom, Tyler exceeds those averages on a national basis, on a state basis, and on a local basis. For example, uh, the national average of African American certified teachers in the, in the pool nationwide is 7%. And we show here at Tyler that the um, uh, ratio of African-American teachers compared to the whole is 16.3%. And I might add, in other cases that we've handled, and I might add that in other cases that where the school districts have been dismissed, they haven't come close to that kind of a record with respect to a very robust and a very sustained recruitment and, more importantly, employment of African-American teachers. With respect to the uh, compliance history, the school's uh, school uh, compliance history, uh, we look back, we have to go back to 1972 up to 2015, of course now 2016, and you'll see the blue bar. That blue bar indicates the years of compliance with respect to the singleton ratio. And if you're in the blue bar, that means you're plus or minus 15%. If you're in the green bar, you're plus or minus 20%. And the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has basically said that as long as you're in those ranges, the blue and the green range, you're in compliance uh, with respect to the court's orders, with respect to the assignment of faculty and the assignment of teachers and staff to a particular campus. You'll see in the green where you exceeded the plus or minus uh, 20%. But the bottom line, the bottom line, if you take a look at 10 years into the order, you'll see that every single campus was in compliance. And what that means from a legal basis is that Tyler had an opportunity to move forward with unitary status 10 years into the order. So you have been in compliance for a very, very long time and you should be commended for that long history of compliance. With respect to student assignment, here's our conclusions. The first is that Tyler Independent School District has eliminated all one race schools that the court found in 1972. Tyler ISD has eliminated all racially identifiable schools. The school district has eliminated racially imbalanced high schools, middle schools, and elementary schools. The school district has eliminated overlapping school attendance zones. It has undergone district-wide dramatic demographic shifts in racial composition. As we all know, Tyler today does not look like Tyler in 1972. It's a little bit different. 
Tyler has implemented magnet programs at Moore Middle School, Jones Elementary, Bell Academy, Caldwell, and Caldwell Arts Academy. All that has been acknowledged. All that has been approved by the court. We also looked at student transfers, and we note that student transfers account for less than 3% of the student body and has not resulted in the recurrence of a dual system. With respect to facilities, Tyler has passed six bond programs from 1975 to 2013 of, with over $450 million. And that basically demonstrates a very strong, a very strong commitment and a very strong support for this board, previous boards, and the current school administration, which is very, very important as the court opines and looks at uh, a, a, the status of a school district in a desegregation case. We've also had new construction and renovation of middle schools, elementary schools, and an update on several of our facilities. We've constructed a new career and technology center. We've opened new schools due to overcrowding, and once again, with court approval. And we closed some schools, again, per the court orders. With respect to transportation, the school district has eliminated the 1970 segregated bus routes identified by the court. The bus routes today, in 2015, and of course now in 2016, those routes serve all eligible students on the route. There are no circuitous or gerrymandered bus routes. With respect to extracurricular activities, i.e. athletics, student academic and non-academic organizations, the Department of Justice found in their 2012 review that you were unitary, you're operating those programs uh, without regard to a dual school, dual school system, and that every child, regardless of race or background, had an opportunity to participate in those extracurricular activities. An additional factor that the courts can consider is the quality of education. And this additional factor um, is sometimes considered by courts in determining whether the school district should be deemed unitary. Court looks at a couple things. The first is racial disparity, whether that exists in, whether that exists in the provision of resources and equal educational opportunity is provided to minority students. As a side note, before I leave that slide, I, I think it's important to note, uh, basically for the record, um, as we reviewed the documents, which we'll talk about in a second, um, our biggest dilemma, our biggest challenge, is providing to the court all the positive indicators uh, that Tyler, all the positive steps all the positive programs, the prior boards, prior administrations, this current board, this current administration has done to promote equal educational opportunity for all students in the Tyler Independent School District. And more importantly, um, looking at uh, the student achievement gap, looking at TEA uh, records, looking at federal uh, records that demonstrate that uh, Tyler not only compares favorably to its peers, but excels when compared to its peers. With respect to the documents reviewed as part of our legal analysis, uh, we had to go back and we had to look at the old original Health and Education Welfare Report, which started out in 1969. Um, we looked at those reports, those original reports that led to the desegregation case. We looked at the 1970 complaint we looked at the subsequent pleadings, motions, docket entries, zoning maps, and court orders. We also had to analyze the compliance reports that this school district has dutifully and faithfully submitted twice a year since 1972 to 2015. We've also analyzed TEA regulatory materials, school report cards, uh, looking at the highly qualified teacher surveys. We've analyzed TISD materials. We've gone back and looked at board minutes. 1972 to 2015. We've looked at campus improvement reports, the superintendent's annual reports. And we've also analyzed the consultant reports. Tyler has a very great track record uh, whenever there's a challenge, whenever there's an issue of going out and getting consultants and uh, looking for the best that can come in and provide the board with best practices, <laughs> programs, uh, policies, and procedures uh, that drive the development of equal educational opportunity to our students. We also reviewed and analyzed the discovery and other materials related to the Department of Justice 2012 investigation. We also reviewed the Department of Justice letter of findings. I might want to add again for the record that the Department of Justice found 
Tyler to be already unitary with respect to extracurricular activities and facilities, which basically means that um, it's a no-brainer on two of those green factors to go ahead and file the appropriate motion seeking relief from court supervision. And also, as a side note, um, as I understand in 2012, you're also very close to the transportation issue as well. Um, and then we also interviewed key TISD administrators. Finally, in conclusion, um, and I don't speak for myself, I, I speak for, my, uh, for a legal team, uh, Jose Gonzalez and uh, Judge Nelson. Um, as you know, we've handled other DSAG cases in the state. We have come to conclude that this school district has satisfied its burden and is eligible for unitary status should the school board decide to adopt that option because it's demonstrated good faith compliance with its desegregation orders for a reasonable period of time, over 40 years, and has removed the vestiges of prior discrimination, and they have been extinguished to the extent practicable. I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to be of service to the school district. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Marcos, and just be available if we have any legal questions going forward. Yes, sir. Um, at this time, we are going to open the floor for comments. Uh, we have asked speakers to sign up um, prior to speaking, and we have six speakers here tonight. Normal procedure for our school board is to allow each speaker five minutes, up to five minutes. Uh, we just ask that, that uh, you try to, um, try to acknowledge that. I will hint to you if you've blown past the five minutes. We don't want to cut anybody off, but we just ask that we keep that in mind. Um, the only other thing sometimes, if everybody's saying the same thing over and over, maybe you can consolidate what you were going to say with what somebody else has said, and <coughs> we can move it along. But I think we're fine. We've got six speakers. Our first one, Mr. Cedric Granberry, and uh, Cedric knows the way to the podium here. Appreciate you coming tonight. I first would like to say thank you to the board uh, for allowing us an opportunity to speak here today. Uh, again, my name is Cedric Granberry, and I am the president of the Tyler Smith County branch of the NAACP. I have also been commissioned to speak on behalf of uh, the African American community, uh, some of the concerned citizens of the African American community. Uh, and I am also a proud parent of a student that is in Tyler ISD, and he's serving as my security tonight just in case I have any problems. My son, Cedric Jr. here, uh, attends Jones Elementary, and he is in the Gifted and Talented program, and I want to commend him for his hard work uh, and also uh, the support system that we provide. But tonight, um, it is a very... Uh, difficult time. I have stood before you before uh, and expressed uh, my sentiments uh, concerning um, issues that have came up in the school district. Um, but on this time, we are particularly talking about something that is very dear and close to our hearts um, that has impacted the school district, which is the DSAG order of 1970. One thing I would like to say is everything that Mr. Uh, the attorney that has spoke really sounds good. It really sounds like um, everything is okay. Uh, but one thing I know as a parent and as a community uh, uh, leader uh, that has played close attention and has sat in meetings with our superintendent and members of the board at times, um, everything is not as it looks. Um, and at this point, we realize that um, one thing that's hard for us to understand is why are we having to be convinced of the fact that we have gained unitary status? If you look at the data and at the facts, uh, truth should already present itself. Why would we have to hire someone to come in and tell us something that we should already know? These are facts that we question and wonder uh, why that is so. And that leads us to the next question of wondering, what exactly is the school district um, trying to be enabled to do that they can't do because of the desegregation order being in place. 
Um, I have uh, noticed that in the report today in the newspaper that one thing that was said that you are having to spend $500,000 on the DSEG order. I would like for that to really be detailed and explain how. Uh, I know it was in regards to busing uh, that was uh, reported in the report. And it's, it's funny, a, 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 a parent called me today and asked me, I'm trying to get understanding about the DSEG order. I'm trying to understand what exactly are the ramifications of it. Uh, and she asked, she said, my children go to Three Lakes and we live in a certain section of town uh, and it's pretty far away from where we stay. Uh, and she said, w if the, the DSEG order is dropped, will my children be able to go to that school? Um, and they ride the bus also. I said, you know what, that's a good question. That is why it's important for us to pay attention to uh, the legalities of the DSEG order and to understand exactly what the initiative and what the school board is trying to do. And so those are the questions that we have to ask you today is what exactly um, will you be able to accomplish that you can't accomplish now? Because it seems like uh, under this administration or the current president, it's very much important that the DSEG order is dropped. I don't know if it causes for the school district to look bad because we're still under a court order, but let's digress for a minute and understand why the court order is in place in the first place. In 1954, we know uh, here in America that the climate uh, throughout our American schools was a dual system of education. Um, blacks went to school on one side of town and whites went to school on another side of town. And many times, children that lived in an area close to a school that they should have been allowed to go to couldn't go to school and had to go to a school that might have been across town uh, for those purposes. The thing about it is uh, when the Brown versus the Board of Education uh, argument uh, court um, proceedings took place, it was argued that uh, dual systems of education uh, segregation was unconstitutional. And as a result, the Supreme Court uh, ruled at that time that this was so. It was unconstitutional to have a dual system of ed education. Such a pinnacle time in our American plight. But what's funny about that, Tyler ISD was a school system that would not comply. They absolutely would not do what they should have done and done right by the children of this city. And that's a fact. 16 years later, it took for um, the um, uh, federal judge of this area, uh, Mr. William Wayne Justice, Judge William Wayne Justice, who I must admire as a person being a white man to understand the forecast and what could possibly happen and what was going to happen. And as a result, had to place a federal uh, DSEG order uh, for school districts that would not comply. And that, since 1970, 46 years later, we are still under. And yeah, it's a shame. It really is a shame, and we should have complied uh, or had unitary status, as the attorney pointed out, 10, 10 years into the order. Well, why haven't we been able to achieve that status? Uh, one thing about um, the ramifications, the data will explain for itself. Now, I would like to say in our position, and I have an official copy of our position as the NAACP that I would ask would become part of the record uh, to state our position and become part of the official proceedings of the board. Uh, the Tyler, Texas branch is in opposition of the DSEG order um, being explored to, explored right now as unitary status, being explored as having, uh, allowing the district for unitary status, which would uh, indicate that we could be relieved of the court order. Uh, and that is an official copy of that to be presented to the board. Um, one thing about it also, um, we would like to say that uh, several issues come to mind uh, that we have to deal with as it pertains to faculty, staff, and students. Um, of course, we know that uh, the demographics of the city have changed somewhat and quite a bit 
Uh, and the, the attorney has stated that this didn't pertain to Hispanics. Uh, so it did pertain to blacks and whites. And one thing about it is, the reason, one reason why I have my son here with me is he attends Jones Elementary. And there are not very many white children that attend Jones. And a lot of the schools on the north side of town actually don't have any uh, white students that attend. Uh, so primarily they are filled with minorities. Uh, also, uh, as it pertains to faculty and staff, uh, there are 1,200 teachers in this district. It really is strange that there are only uh, less than 20% that are African American and uh, less than 100 that are uh, Hispanic. Uh, out of that 1,200, there being over 900 white teachers, we have a problem with the fact that we cannot find uh, teachers to hire, and we hear constantly from the Human Resources Department that uh, we cannot find the type of teachers that fit our program. Well, madam and uh, sir, we ask you, what type of program do you have? We are wondering why that qualified teachers that would come out of uh, college and be able to pass the examination cannot uh, be part of this system. And it presents a problem that presents a climate in this city and in our school district that has our parents and teachers frustrated because many times teachers are afraid to uh, exhibit what they're going through because of the, 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 the demand that they're under from day to day. And we find a problem with that. Also, um, as it pertains to principals in our schools here in the school district, we only have uh, four African-American principals out of 29 schools in this school district. Sir, that is a problem. Um, also, um, I have, we have gotten notified that there also is a policy in place that if a student uh, transfers to uh, a high school, opposite of the middle school that they are going to, that they can face two years of ineligibility uh, in, in regards to sports. And I would like for, to make sure that that's clarified because if that has changed, I want to know. But as we know, that is policy that has been put in place as of this school year by uh, our AD. And that is a problem, sir, because it is important. You're at, you're at nine minutes, just letting you know. At nine minutes. Yeah. It is important for us that a student is not penalized for a transfer. And also, I want to make this point in my closing that uh, also, Moore Middle School at one time received $34,000 to their band, while John Tyler, as a high school, only received $21,000, and Bolter, as a middle school on the north side of Tyler, only received $12,000. These are problems. And also, we have lost a lot of students as white students to private school. I tell you, sir, if we do not do something about the frustration of the black community, you're going to lose a lot of the black students to private school as well. And we have to understand that the funding uh, federally that we have, everything is on the line at this point. And as a black community, an African American community, and as the NAACP, we are not pleased with how the board is handling the climate of this school system at this time. And we oppose the DSEG order being explored and the unitary status being explored by the district and school board at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mrs. Kristen Baldwin. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Thank you for your service as school board members. And thank you for the opportunity to speak about the status of the Tyler ISD 1970 desegregation order. Um, Thank you for taking the responsibility to visit this desegregation order to determine the status of compliance um, and the opportunity to be granted the unitary status by the Department of Justice. I'm Kristen Baldwin and I'm here representing Tyler Proud and I'd like to read a statement on behalf of our organization. 
We believe Tyler ISD is working hard every day to make our schools and city better for our students and families. But great school districts need an engaged and supportive community to help advocate and to hold the district accountable to provide each student with the best educational opportunities with the resources available. It's time for the 1970 desegregation order to be lifted. Tyler Proud supporters are assured that Tyler ISD does not operate in a discriminatory manner and offers all programs and educational opportunities to students without regard to race. The reasons for the desegregation order were resolved many years ago, and there is evidence to verify that all across the district. We believe the school district will be able to operate more effectively and more efficiently without being under the control of this federal order. We want Tyler ISD to have the flexibility to serve the needs of each student, to allow for more neighborhood schools, to use resources as needed according to performance data, and to allow for more local control. This is better for our community and it's better for our students. We believe that this is an important step to move to move in closer to having great schools in Tyler, Texas. We are hopeful that Tyler ISD will join the many other school districts in our nation that have been granted unitary status and are no longer under a federal desegregation order. Tyler Proud is an all-inclusive, community-wide, positive organization that exists to bring people together to improve, support, and hold accountable Tyler ISD. Tyler Proud is made up of more than 3,000 parents, grandparents, students, educators, business owners, and community leaders who believe great schools make a great community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Baldwin. Our next speaker is Mr. Bob Brewer. I guess you got my text. Uh, I hate to be a broken record. I've been up here multiple times. I'm addressing the segregation, desegregation in Tyler. And as far as uh, good gestures to show that we're not being intentionally segregated, using emergency funds, it was once reported, emergency funds to build that swimming pool one and a half miles in the south, Tyler, when we have a perfectly good pool one half mile north in North Tyler at Fun Forest that was rebuilt 20 years ago to world-class standards. I just think it's, it was the wrong thing to do and it's a bad gesture for whoever decides if we if the desegregation should be or if the order should be lifted um, councilman moore has already told me that the uh, wildert pool will probably be closed due to lack of use when this new pool gets built in south tyler that residents won't have access to as they do at a public pool it just seems a slap in the face and an insult to the community in the north that would benefit greatly from having TISD swimmers in North Tyler. Most of those guys are super high academic achievers, just like all the triathletes and marathon runners that I know. And it would just be the greatest gesture to our segregated community that we're trying to come together. And I'm sorry I repeat myself so much. I know this is over, over the, it's water under the bridge, but it just seems an insult. And I'm sorry. All right, our next speaker is Miss Michelle Carr. Really weird. 
Good evening. Thank you, Legal Counsel, for your report. And um, I just want to say I commend the board. I know that we wrestled the whole time that I was on the school board um, with the implications of the DSEG order and the, the cost that it drives and the um, burden on our staff. And so I just want to commend you guys for taking on this challenge. And um, I do pray and hope that it goes forward. Um, the the DSEG order is burdensome. It's antiquated. It wastes a ton of staff time and money. And those that is all money and resources that really need to be directed back into the classroom. Um, I think that the number was quoted at $500,000 a year. And it's I would say that was probably conservative. Um, it isn't just with the bus routes, as far as my understanding. It has to do with all the um, paperwork that goes along with it, too. Um, also, I just wanted to commend TISD because I know, having been on the board, that the, pro the hiring practices are to provide the best and most effective teachers and administrators in the classroom and on our campuses. And I saw that firsthand as well. So I just want to commend you all for your efforts. And I know that it takes courage to do this. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker is Mrs. Laura Griffith. Laura? You're OK? OK. All right, next we move to Miss Natalie Booker. OK. All right. All right. Okay, at this time, that is all the speakers we have tonight. And just to give you an idea going forward, we have another meeting Thursday night. Um, there'll be a public partic participation section of that meeting, just like there is at every regular meeting. All of us um, are available by email, uh, most of us by phone. Most of y'all know how to get hold of us if you need us. Feel free to call any one of us if you want to talk about it. I'm happy to sit down with anyone and hear if you feel more comfortable talking offline than on. Um, I'm open to that as well. Um, so as a board, we appreciate you coming out tonight. We appreciate the input you've given, and we will continue the process. Um, that's all we have on our agenda for now, I believe. So if um, any executive session? No. Okay. I don't think so. For tonight, that's all we have on the agenda, and um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? All right. We are adjourned. Second. Aye.